what does it take to heat a greenhouse? And what we're going to do is focus on the systems for an actively heated greenhouse environment. And to talk about greenhouse heating systems, we need to talk a little bit about the physics of what heat is. And this particular section, I'm going to use a term called thermostatics. And thermostatics is actually a scientific field where we're looking at the equilibrium of heat, how heat is moved in the greenhouse, or in a, in a system heat transfer, the thermal properties, and work on some of the, the terminology of heat. Heat is that concept or the quality of something being warm, hot. The energy that's involved uh, by accelerated vibration of molecules. Anything that's above absolute zero has heat. That means the molecules are actually moving. Absolute zero is that point where the molecules actually stop moving. Temperature is not heat. Temperature is an index of heat. It's a measurement. When we say that you have a temperature because you have the flu, well, gosh, I hope you have a temperature because that's, you have some, something. We're saying we have a temperature that's out of norm. So we measure the temperature to determine what the scale of hotness or coldness is for our system. So we need to talk about units of heat quantity. And the primary one is what's called a calorie. And it's a lowercase c. And that's the amount of heat that's required to raise one gram of water one degree centigrade. Okay? The amount of energy that's required to raise one gram of water one degree centigrade. Of course, that's at sea level, at barometric pressure of standards, and all that kind of stuff, but we're not going to worry about that. If it's got a capital C, that's actually a thousand calories, and that's what the dietitians use. So when you say you're going to consume that beer, light beer, that's 100 calories, it's actually 100,000 calories. But the dietitians take three of the zeros away, otherwise everybody would be panicking. But <laughs> so it's actually a kilocalorie. Kilocalorie, kilo, 1,000, equates to 3.9689 BTUs of energy, and that's called a British thermal unit. First thing I don't want you to think you have to do in this class is to memorize numbers. That's what books are for. Okay? Don't feel like you're going to be tested on how many BTUs are in a calorie. It's not going to happen. <laughs> British thermal unit is the unit that we actually use mostly in a greenhouse. It's not the metric unit, even though it says British. And that's the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. And we use BTUs in this country. A BTU is 252 calories. Again, don't feel like you have to memorize conversion numbers. I don't expect that of you. Another term that we use is horsepower. It's actually horsepower per hour. But horsepower is how a lot of times uh, a boiler manufacturer will classify their heat, their boilers as in horsepower. And one horsepower per hour is equivalent to 33,475 BTUs per hour. Now how they get this horsepower, I don't understand, <coughs> but um, this is where these units come from. If you want to see real horsepower, the Clydesdales are out at uh, Budweiser right now, I believe. So. And if you go through the tour, look at the Clydesdales, do the Budweiser tour, at the end you get free beer. All right. So. In a greenhouse, what we're really worried about is heat transfer. And there are three kinds of heat transfer that we t worry about in the greenhouse. And the first one is convection. 
Convection is the mass movement of particles along with their kinetic energy from one point to another. In other words, we take heated particles and move it in mass to another part of an area and that's what convection is. Oftentimes you'll hear the word convective current. Convection is moving of heated air through the system. Those of you who have a furnace at home, that furnace turns on the flame, heats up the manifold, pushes air across the manifold, moves the warm air into your bedroom where you stay warm at night. That is convective heating, that's convective current. That's how we transfer heat via convection. So when we have air, heated air, moving throughout a space, that's what happens. Conduction is the transfer of that kinetic energy from one molecule to another via collisions. Okay? Uh, I don't hear any flu people in the room, so everybody reach out and touch your neighbor's palm of your hands. Just reach out and touch. Okay? I'll get you two. Whoa! You're hot. <laughs> so are you. Okay, who felt hot? Who felt heat? Okay, who felt cold? Okay, who felt somebody that, who felt uh, cold? Now, what you just experienced was conductive energy exchange, okay? If you felt heat, you just robbed that person of energy. Okay? So th that, in other words, energy moves on a gradient. It moves from one point to another via, uh, it goes from one higher level of energy to a lower level of energy. If you felt warmth, that means you are the lower level of energy taking that energy from that other source via conduction. Okay? If you felt cold, you were giving that energy. Okay? And that's through the collision, your collision of the palms was roughly the collision of the molecules, okay? Now, how fast that goes is really related to what we call the delta T, or the difference in the temperature. So if, if you felt really warm, like some of you maybe felt somebody warm on one side and a, just a little warm on the other, you probably weren't losing energy as fast, okay? So how the delta T, and the way we slow that delta T down is through insulation materials, um, air gaps, and such as that. So the thermal conductivity is the ability of a material to transfer heat through conduction, and the physicists use uh, the value of K. So the first one was convection, the next one is conduction, the next one is radiation. Now radiation is that electrical transfer of heat energy through a mass or through a medium without being absorbed by that medium, okay? Radiation. Now when you think about the radiators up against the wall, it's we use the word radiator, but actually what happens, it's only getting about 60% is coming off as radiation. The rest of it is go coming out through conduction and convection. The conduction is happening where the air molecules next to the radiator are colliding with the radiator itself, being heated via conduction, and then the convective currents move those molecules away from the radiator, okay? Radiation is, um, Oftentimes, uh, th think of it as when you walk outside and you feel the warmth of the sun, you're receiving that electromagnetic spectrum onto your face when you feel that warmth, and the warmth is actually your body mass converting it to energy or heat. So what happens in a greenhouse, the primary points that we lose energy one of them is convective currents. We lose energy through convection. And that's the energy that's lost through the cracks. It infiltrates out through the cracks and crevices. Air is leaking from the greenhouse. Convective currents 
<coughs> also will increase conductive heat loss. In other words, the higher the wind rate moves across the greenhouse, it's going to increase the conductive current because it's going to strip those molecules more quickly away from the roof of the greenhouse. Therefore, it's going to increase the conductive currents. It's going to increase the delta T. <coughs> the superstructure is going to affect the rate of infiltration. But it's going to be um, mainly lost through conductive loss. In other words, some structures lose more energy through conduction than others. Um, metal is more conductive than wood. Do you ever have a beer can made out of wood? No, it's made out of aluminum. So it's a very highly conductive material. And we use that as a C factor or construction factor. Wind speed affects that delta two by reducing the boundary layer. So if you take your hand and you blow across it, it feels a little cool. What you're doing is stripping the boundary layer away so you can increase that um, air uh, airflow or in decrease the boundary layer and increase the heat loss. We call that the wind factor. And when we do heating calculations a week from Tuesday, you'll see how all these work in designing and sizing a boiler system. Okay. Now radiant heat loss is that energy that's lost through the glazing material and um, also takes into account, we need to take into account how much energy goes through the glazing material through radiant heat loss along with your conductive heat loss. So here we have a greenhouse and our friend the sun generates electromagnetic energy and it goes into uh, the greenhouse uh, through direct energy <coughs> or through scattered diffused energy as it's um, some of it is reflected back out some of it comes into the greenhouse and is reflected and it's used as photosynthesis or something like that the energy also is absorbed by structures, absorbed by the plants, and re-radiated back as infrared energy. Okay. So the infrared is the thermal radiation from walks and you know sidewalks, the soil, the pots, the structure, and we also have air movement that through transpiration, evaporation, is cooling. Um, but that's pretty much our energy balance of a greenhouse. So conduction, convection, infrared. So what we need to do is we need to design our heating systems in such a way that the capacity meets the demands of the heat loss per unit time or hour. We use a calculator units per hour. And to maintain that temperature, we use three kinds of systems. We use unit heaters, and those are typically forced air. Central heating systems, which typically requires a boiler and a pipe system. And then radiant heat, which we'll talk about at the end. Unit heater systems are by far the least expensive to install for startups. What they were talking about is multiple independent units that we can put in the greenhouse, usually hang them in the roof. They're typically fan driven. The fan drives the air across a heated manifold. And these are the least expensive systems to install. They're also the easiest to expand because we're not having to worry about rebuilding boilers. So they just go in there and hang up a new unit heater. So if you're building a greenhouse over time, it's easier to do. So a standard heating system, standard unit heater, it has a self-contained firebox or combustion chamber and that's on the bottom and these are typically natural gas or propane okay and that natural gas fire then goes up through a set of heat exchangers and these heat exchangers are tubes and we're using this fan 
to blow air across that heat exchanger to push the hot air into the greenhouse. Finally, it's got to have an exhaust stack. In, uh, we, in greenhouses, we don't use unvented heaters. They're not safe, both for plants and humans. So we use a vented heater, and which is a, an exhaust stack like such as this, and that is the easiest heating system to install, the cheapest heating system to install, and easiest to work with. Most unit heaters that are gas fired have outputs of around 20,000 to 320,000 BTUs per hour. We get into these 320,000 BTUs per hour, it takes a pneumatic lift to hang them and all kinds of stuff, whereas a 20,000 BTU per hour unit heater is much like we saw in the Quonsets at Perk, and a couple of guys can hang it up. They run on fuels like number two fuel oil, kerosene, liquid propane, or natural gas. Um, one of the issues with unit heaters is we do cannot exchange fuel sources among unit heaters. We either order it to for the fuel source we're going to use. If we need to change the fuel source, we have to change the orifices. Um, the easiest orifice to change is one between liquid propane and natural gas. Those are typically something that uh, a plumber can do, but if you're going to switch to fuel oil or kerosene, that's a completely different unit heater design with pumps and such as that. We like to use what's called horizontal discharge that's pushing the air across the greenhouse. Okay, Downdraft um, unit heaters that are hung up at the ceiling or something like that push the energy down typically cause dry spots and uneven heat in our greenhouse. So here's a, a couple of another unit heater system. Uh, this is a, a unit heater that's mounted on the side. Uh, the box is outside and pushes the heat inside. Here's your propane tank. This is um, a modified unit heater system from the poultry industry so forth. Now, when we put a gas burning or a fuel burning device in the greenhouse, it requires oxygen. And it's very easy to deplete the oxygen level in the greenhouse quickly with these unit heaters. Does it hurt our plants? No, it doesn't hurt our plants, but it will burn itself out. It'll actually use, in a tight covered greenhouse, a tightly covered polyethylene greenhouse, during a very cold night, actually the unit heater will burn enough to completely exhaust the oxygen supply and it'll burn itself out. So we have to re uh, provide air venting for our unit heaters and we typically want to put one square inch of uh, air venting um, for every 2500 BTUs that you're going to put into the system. Some uh, boilers have forced air, I mean, unit heaters have forced air, forced fresh air from the outside, but typically most of them use just a venting system. And this, my little uh, artistic endeavor here, this is the most common where we just take PVC pipe, uh, four, six, eight inch PVC pipe, and this put it in there so it's got a fresh air source in the greenhouse. If you have a gas fired furnace in your home, or apartment where you're living today, you have to have, in the state of Colorado, fresh air vent. And I'm sure you've all seen those maybe. And you're standing in there and go, wow, that's cold. Don't cover it up. That's the fresh air to feed the furnace because our houses are so tight. Actually, if you're living in a manufactured home, those houses are so tight, they actually have to have more surface area because they're built so tight. So remember that we're building a carbon, we're, we're burning a carbon-based fuel. It's got to have oxygen. Almost all of our standard unit heaters are only 80% efficient. That means 80% of the energy that we're burning is actually used to heat that greenhouse. We get into the higher efficiency unit heaters. They're, uh, of course, they cost more money and these sorts of things. Um, 
but that 80 percent, the 20 percent is the energy that goes out the stack. That's the heat loss. And energy efficient ones that go up to 90, 95 percent efficiency, those are the unit heaters that, I mean, I've seen unit heaters designed that are so efficient that the exhaust stack is made out of polyethylene pipe. But most of them are, those are really expensive. Um, the other thing we need to worry about with heaters that aren't burning efficiently, your unit heaters need to be checked at least once a year by a certified HVAC technician. Um, if they're not burning efficiently, not only are they going to be uh, letting off uh, carbon monoxide, which is hazardous to your employers, employees, I don't think you worry about your employer, no, employees, but it, it also releases ethylene gas, and ethylene gas is hazardous to plants. And there are some sulfurs and stuff like that sometimes we'll see. But we need to have fresh air into that greenhouse. Yes? Is that the same ethylene that they were talking about spraying the tomatoes with? Ethylene? Yeah. It's the same gas. It's the same gas that they use to uh, ripen bananas and avocados, pineapples. Uh, later in the semester, we'll talk about ethylene as a growth promoter, ethylene as a um, post-harvest plant damaging. It's, uh, it does everything. So. So we want our propane systems to burn as efficient as possible, and we don't want ethylene, we don't want propylene and other hydrocarbons and such as that. Heat distribution in a unit heater typically is just a fan in a small greenhouse, like at our Quonsets, we only have a fan, the fan of the motor itself, or we'll have HAF fans to move it around. Or we use convection tubing, which is similar to the ducting in your home, or what we call horizontal airflow fans. Now the convection tubes, this was popular starting in the uh, 1980s and um, up in some greenhouses still use them. These are poly tubes that are three, two, three feet in diameter. They run the length of the greenhouse and they have little holes every poked in them and the unit heater inflates the polytube and the warm air then goes out through the, through the holes and mixes with the cool air. And we can also use these polytubes when the heating system isn't running to give us more uniformity in our greenhouse. So here's an example of a polytube connected to a steam unit heater. Um, and this is, we've taken, they used to have these at PERC. I've taken them all out because I'm switching, have one unit heater in each corner to give a circular pattern. The polytube, uh, when the unit heater <coughs> turns on, inflates and distributes the heat. They're not as popular as there once was. Can you see any reason why? Shade. shade. They shade the greenhouse. Of course, it's poly, it's supposed to be clear. How long does it stay clear? See the dirt and dust on top? That comes in about two weeks. So it, so forth. So the original designs were, and we call them jet tubes, was to run the entire length of a greenhouse. If you've got a greenhouse that's 100 feet long, you can turn on your heating system and um, the unit heaters are he located here or either side. They blow into the jet tube mechanism and the jet tube then pushes the hot air throughout the greenhouse. The other neat thing about this design is if we only need a little winter cooling, we run that jet tube and open up this little vent on the outside and it pushes that cool air in the greenhouse and it's not quite that heat shock. So this is called a jet tube. And it's very, you'll still see it, they, they still make them, they still work with them, they're not as popular as they were say 20 years ago. Here's a, another jet tube system where the unit heater is connected directly to the system, goes into, the, there's a baffle and it's pushed out through the jet tube. And here's my graphic representation of how a jet tube works. It works pretty good. It's efficient, but it does cause some shading and such as that. Yes? Is the tube generally retractable or is it 
Is the tube retractable? No, it's hung up permanently. Most people run a fan 24-7 just to keep it open, to keep it air moving. And we're finding that it's more efficient now to use HAF fans rather than these, um, but it does work. You can also use those convection tubes for under bench heating, like if you want to take and mount your unit heaters low to the ground and run that convection tube under the benches, the length of the benches, that way you get air movement, you get your heat rising. I've only seen that in greenhouses a couple of times because it's really hard to manage. For uh, most greenhouse air distribution, the modern choice is to use what's called a horizontal airflow fan. And you'll, pe you'll hear people in the industry call them half fans. It's not H-A-L-F, it's not two divided by one, it's or one by, never mind. Um, it's a horizontal fan used to circulate the temperature. And these give us more uniformity. We're looking at about 10 to 100 feet per minute, uh, 1 30th to 1 15th horsepower. And you know they're only about 16, 18 inch diameter fan. So we're not talking a big fan. But what it does do is it provides us really uniform control of our greenhouse environment. So here's an, an HAF fan and this picture uh, really kind of sort of is um, dis, um, can't tell the scale. It's actually hanging about 10 inches below that truss. Looks like it's in the truss, but it's not. It's hanging below the truss. And most of the fans we see today are something like that. Here is a modified convection tube. They were using this as a convection tube for a while in this particular greenhouse, but now they just use it as an HAF fan to move the energy. Again, this picture is hard to see the scale because here's an HAF. This HAF fan is actually 12 feet in front of this unit heater. So we're using unit heaters, is, um, pushes out the air with its fan, and this fan pushes it, gives it another boost. When you, take, when you do photography, you need to learn how to work with your depth of field. So we want to set up a circular pattern. Ideally, I want the circular pattern three feet above the crop. But there's people like Thomas over here that are tall and they want to run their head into the fan. So you've got to put it up. Typically, we want it three feet, but we want it below the eaves for sure. We want the first thing. We first fans 10 to 15 feet away from the wall. If you, make, if you mount them too close to the wall, you don't get good airflow behind them. Okay? And we want about no more than 50 feet apart. So if you've got a 100 foot greenhouse, you need to have two fans. You can use your heaters as your corner fans. However, you need to think about using those Fans, as you, those fans and those heaters as your corner fans because they're going to wear out faster. You're going to have to replace the motor. But a fan motor is really not that expensive. So, uh, quarter of the house width from the side walls. The last fan per side should be about 40 or 50 feet from the end wall, which is blowing into. Okay. So in a single span greenhouse, this is a greenhouse that's only 60 feet long or less, we have our unit heaters or our HAF fans mounted in the corners and we're setting up a circular motion. And that's the idea behind an HAF fan. Just get that circular motion moving through the greenhouse. Gives us more uniformity. We're going to hang our uh, climate control sensor right at dead middle. We're a quarter of the way from the side wall, and we're 15 feet in from the end wall. If it's more than 60 feet, I need two fans, 50 feet apart, and that way I continue my circular motion. This is the solution to cold spots in the greenhouse. It's a solution to warm spots in the greenhouse. By moving that air consistently and uniformly, the crop is more uniform, 
By removing the cold spots, we're actually doing a lot to control humidity, we're reducing the humidity. Reducing the humidity decreases the amount of leaf spot diseases and reduces the amount of fungicides that you'll need to use in that greenhouse. This is a significant part of your integrated pest management program. HAF fans eliminates fungicide sprays. If you don't want to use chemicals, invest in technology. Multi-span greenhouses, where we're gutter connect and the, in the interior walls are open, we need to think about how I want to move that air as well. I'm going to put a set of HAF fans in each bay, okay, because that gable is going to not allow me to move air completely around. I'm going to want to put it in such a way that the air movement is together. So for instance, the top greenhouse, this multi-span greenhouse, the wind direction is counterclockwise. In the bottom of this gutter connect greenhouse, the wind movement is clockwise. That way the air is going together and not creating turbulence. Uh, it's more efficient this way. You're thinking maybe, well, more turbulence might give me more uniformity. The answer is no. You want the air moving together. Okay. So, Unit heating systems are the easiest to install, the cheapest to install. Unit heating systems are the easiest to expand. But over the long term, central heating systems are more e efficient and more economical, but they cost more to install. So what we're doing is one or more boilers in a central location, and we're moving the energy from the boiler to the greenhouses by a series of pipes. And we're either moving steam or hot water, uh, older greenhouses are steam, <coughs> newer greenhouses are typically hot water. They're more expensive to install, but you can use it more inexpensive fuels, and you can also use a multiple or dual fuel heating systems. You can have multiple fuels for one system, which I'll show you in a little bit why that's beneficial. The heat, you have a heat exchanger, firebox, flu, um, you have um, water, a standard boiler is the, the, either tubes are filled with water or the tubes or the flue gases are surrounded by water. We want to put the boiler in a service building. Most boilers are not really good candidates to be in the greenhouse because they've got lots of moving parts and too much moisture and stuff. And you want to make sure that you locate your stack in such a way, the old days when we had coal-fired devices, that we had to have make sure those stacks didn't cast a shadow on the greenhouse. So here's a picture of a standard boiler. It's a standard steam boiler. It's got a firebox with a blower. It blows the, the energy across the bottom of the boiler. The energy then comes back up and goes through the tubes, the fire tubes, and the heat goes through the fire tubes. The fire tubes are surrounded with water and then it goes out the stack. So most steam boilers are fire tube boilers. The gases run through the, the hot gases run through the tubes surrounded by water. They take a high volume of water, so they take a long time to heat up. So typically, even when we're not using heat, we're firing that boiler all day long so that I can have instant heat when I need it. Some people will take those boilers and shut them down when the sun comes out, and then three or four or five o'clock in the afternoon when the sun starts to go down, then they'll start warming their boiler to get it fired up, because usually it takes a couple of hours for these things to heat. So it, uh, sometimes it's more, e usually it's more economical just to keep the thing hot all the time. So they're slow to heat, but they're slow to cool. Uh, multiple fuels, uh, wood, coal, oil, natural gas, um, they, they use it all. And there are modern boilers that are coming out that we won't talk about that are high efficiency boilers that use wood in different ways and such as that. So here's a, a fairly large boiler in a greenhouse. This is a fire tube boiler. It's a steam boiler. 
Um, here we have the firebox and the blower. And there are the fire tubes. So the fire tubes, this is where the firebox pushes the flame across the bottom, hits the baffle, comes back around, and it's the heat goes through these tubes. And these tubes are surrounded by water. Okay, and the tubes heat the water and turn it into steam. So that is a fire tube boiler. And we have all different sizes. To give you a scale on these boilers, my eye level is right about here, right under these handles. So this is a pretty large boiler. This is a fire tube water boiler. It, this is one that uses hot water. Now, a water tube boiler is where the water runs through the tubes, and the tubes typically have fins. The water runs through the tubes, and then there, the tubes of water are surrounded by air. The boilers that we, the little boilers that we saw over at the University Greenhouse, the backup boilers, those are water tube boilers. Now, they're quick to heat and they're quick to cool because they have a smaller volume of water. Whereas that steam boiler has this huge mass of water, these have small volumes of water. So we don't cycle those quite as much. They only burn natural gas or propane. We can't put other fuel sources, solid fuels such as coal or wood, in these units because it will soot up the fins. Okay. Now these are lot, a, le a lot less expensive, they're smaller, and they're easier to install. Typically a steam boiler has to be installed by a licensed boiler technologist or technician that's got the certification and the training. A water tube boiler can be installed by any journeyman plumber. In fact, I've installed four. So they're not a challenge. So what's cool about water tube boilers is we can stack them in series, have backup, and we, can only, we only need to fire the number of water tube boilers based upon the demand. Say we may have a series of zone pumps, which you can see these green pumps up here, they're going directly to one greenhouse. If we're, we can run different zone temperatures and these boilers only have to run based on its demand. Here you can see the vents on the left, that's for fresh air in this particular operation. This is a greenhouse outside of Apopka, Florida. And these are the boilers that heat the greenhouses at Bellagio. So. so with the central heating system, we have to have a heat distribution uh, system. We have to move the hot water or the steam from the boiler to the greenhouses. And we're going to use pipes or something like that. Two inch pipe is typical for hot water. Uh, hot water is at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we have zone pumps. The zone pumps are typically going to individual greenhouse sections. Uh, they have to be built in such a way to absorb or take into account expansion and contraction of the, or of the water itself that we usually put in um, expansion chambers. Um, the coils on the greenhouses, we uh, put coils, if we put in coils on the perimeter walls, we may need to make sure we're putting on enough to replace the heat loss. We typically do it low and against the curtain wall. And we need to have two inch clearance between our walls and our pipes so that we get those convective currents moving through the system. When we start to stack our pipes, when we stack pipes on top of each other, we're actually reducing the efficiency of our surface area. One long pipe is more efficient than a stack. But if, we're, but if you're going to have to have so many feet of stacks of pipe in that greenhouse and it's longer than your greenhouse, which it typically is, we have to stack it in, in, in a serpentine fashion. So we want to make sure 
that we keep it up. Finning, on the other hand, increases the BTU. When we start putting little fins on it, we increase the radiation surface area or the conduction surface area. So for instance, here is a finned steam pipe from PERC. This steam trap is an important part of a heating system. If you notice on the left, the steam pipe is out of steel, and on the right, it's out of a rubber hose. Now the water that's coming out of that is hot, so you have to have a rubber hose that's, that's, susceptible, that's tolerant of the heat. But what the steam trap does is that it blocks all of the energy of the steam. It doesn't allow the, energy, the steam to pass through this valve until it's converted to water. And that phase change generates 970 BTUs per pound of water, which is not what I told you on Tuesday. I told you what, 720? That's why I don't memorize numbers, because I don't remember them either. But that phase change, when it goes from steam to water, is releasing 970 BTUs of energy per pound. When that temperature of the water is then dropped because it's gone from steam to water, this valve opens up and it goes out to the condensate line. Steam valves, um, mo this is an uh, electric steam valve. The steam valves we use at PERC or on university campuses are pneumatic. Uh, the steam valves are set, they're typically what's called normally open. When you look at valves, you'll see a little classification NC or NO. NO refers to normally open, NC refers to normally closed. Okay? Most water valves for an irrigation system are normally closed. It takes power to open it. In a greenhouse on valve systems, we want to have them as normally open. So it takes power to keep them closed or pneumatic air pressure to keep it closed. The idea is when the pneumatic pressure is off or the power is off, it opens and allows the steam to pass. It's kind of a fail-safe mechanism, right? And we have to have expansion chambers. If you don't have expansion chambers, the system will jump off the wall. Some boilers can be designed to scrub and extract the carbon dioxide out of the exhaust fumes. By capturing the carbon dioxide, we can use that to fertilize photosynthesis in the greenhouse. In fact, there are power plant facilities that are building greenhouses, taking the carbon dioxide, pumping it through the greenhouse to be carbon neutral. Okay. Where do you put your pipes? Well, we used to put the pipes overhead because that way you can see them when they're leaking and they're out of the way and you're not tripping on them, but they cast shadows. You may need to put pipes overhead or under the gutters to melt snow so your greenhouse doesn't collapse. So we used to put our pipes above the greenhouse, but that's a lot of shadows. It is important to have these pipes, though, under the gutters. So some people will put their pipes in the ground under the benches, in the ground beds, in the concrete floor, but I want the heat where the plants are. So this is a typical design for a um, cut flower greenhouse operation where we're putting the pipes along the ground. Under the benches. This is a hot water system under a bench. This is a, a fin tube system. These are very efficient because they're easy to, uh, to modify. Actually, these kind of snap together um, as a kit. Under bench heating. Here, the, even though these are ben rolling top benches, they're suspended on, on little chains. They stay under there and they're connected with a hot water tube at the other end. Very efficient. Um, this is a cucumber greenhouse in the Netherlands where these, the heating pipes are along the ground, and they you also use them as tracks to run their equipment. Kind of like little carts running on the, on the tracks. 
This is a steam lines that are just laid on the ground in a greenhouse. This is a greenhouse full of lysianthus. And um, they just run the steam pipe on the ground, heats the soil, heats the air, very efficient. Okay. So Hintral heating systems, you can use convection tubes. We can still going to use HAF fans. We can have uh, unit heaters that will, that are, they don't have a firebox. They have hot water exchanger or a steam exchanger. That's what we saw over at the university greenhouses and at Perk. We saw those uh, unit heaters designed like that. Um, this one on the right is from Perk. This one on the left is from the support greenhouse at Bellagio. You can hang them anywhere. Um, heated in-floor tubing is really efficient. Um, when we heat the floor, we can dry the floor quickly. Um, you might require a little bit of sidewall heating. So here's an example of a heated floor system where the hot water is going into the concrete. Um, if you want to still have under bench heating or hot water heating, we c there's also um, another heating system called, uh, it's, um, the old term is biotherm. It's an EPDM tubing. It's a little PV tubing that's about uh, the th diameter of a pencil and we run hot water through it and set our flats on top of it. Um, works really well for propagation benches. Here is a uh, uh, a hot water heating system that was built um, at a greenhouse. Uh, this is uh, at um, AgriStarts um, in Florida where they've just used regular old PVC pipe and they're running warm water through there. Here's another picture. This is a uh, operation, this is a system that's probably built out of stuff you can get at Home Depot more sophisticated system. Uh, this is the Delta T system where we've got these EDP and polymer tubing running on the bench top. Uh, very efficient. Um, we've got a, a manifold and a tube that runs the length of the greenhouse. And the idea is to call, we call root zone heating where we're heating just that area of the bench. It rises up through the crop. And the rest of the greenhouse, we don't worry about the temperature too much. We just want to keep that crop area warm. So these are very efficient. Infrared radi heating systems. Um, infrared heating systems are um, where we're heating a, a pipe or heating a, 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 a manifold to a temperature to a point where it no longer is generating heat through conduction or convection is generating heat through radiation. And we'll run these, uh, the burn gas through the tubing um, with an aluminum reflector over the top, pushing the infrared radiation. The idea behind infrared radiation is that it's heating the surface that the radiation touches and not the surrounding air. So the idea is that we're not heating the air, we're only heating the plants and the surfaces of the greenhouse. You've all experienced infrared heat. When you've gone into a warehouse store or something like that and you walk next to the cashier and all of a sudden you stand in a little patch of area that's warm. That's an infrared heater that's hung up in the rafters that's generating an infrared heat down towards that worker that's standing there. So this is an example of an infrared heating system. This is at Welby Gardens and Basically, what it is is just a long tube inside a reflector that's superheated to a temperature where it puts that infrared radiation to the bench to the floor. So it's got to be about five feet away so it doesn't fry the plants, of course. We're going to place them 20 to 30 feet apart. And there's very little temperature, very little heat transferred to the air. So when you walk through that greenhouse, you're going to feel cold. The first thing you're going to want to do is turn the heat up. Well, we're growing plants. We're not heating your bedroom. Okay? If so, in other words, we have to measure the temperature at the plant, not the temperature of the room. So infrared, greenhouses are heated with infrared typically feel cold. You have a question? Um, what about fans? 
Good question. What about fans? In an infrared heated greenhouse, we don't use fans because that fan will strip the heat off the plant. Do they have more pests? Do they have more pests? No. No, because we're heating the surface. Well, we have fewer uh, diseases because we're heating the plants and their convective currents are flowing away from the plant. So we use reduced HAF fans. Now, these don't give us any snow melt protection and it's typically 20 to 120,000 BTUs per hour. It'll heat an area two times the height, so if it's 10 feet off the ground, it'll heat a 20 foot area. It is overhead, it is gonna create some shadows. The firebox is here, it's hard to see. And the firebox shoots the uh, hot gases to the right and left. And then it's got a, a ducted, powered exhaust that takes that exhaust air out of the greenhouse. Um, you need to make sure that this exhaust system is on the, in Colorado, on the eastern side of the greenhouse, because from the western side of the greenhouse, the westerlies are going to push the air back into that firebox. Question? Are these the heaters like they have outside when you're waiting in a line? Okay. That is a modified infrared heater, yes. Yeah. You'll see a lot of these in, um, I think they've got infrared heaters installed at Whole Foods in that little cafe area outside. And hockey arena and stuff like this. And another picture. Other kinds of heating systems. Uh, this is a heating system where they've, there's a, there's a little uh, two metal duct work up in the roof of this greenhouse, up in the gable, and they're using a set of fans to pull that hot air out of the gable and they're pumping it under the benches. And this greenhouse, this is the only heat that they use and they keep, by he taking that hot air, putting it under the benches, that concrete, these benches are made out of concrete blocks and that mass of concrete holds that heat in. Of course, they're only growing, they're growing spinach and lettuce, so it's a cool season crop anyway. Um, solar, solar pan, these are hot water, these are liquid solar panels that they take uh, a glycol and circulate it through the greenhouse under these benches to the left. Again, they're growing salad greens. Um, this particular operation is using a glycol. If you're using water, you have to have a technology to drain those every night so they don't freeze. Air cap pads for retention. Backup power is important so that to run your heating system when the power goes down. You want to make sure that you get your fuel there before, if you're having to buy propane, you want to make sure the propane is there when it gets cold because you're going to run out of propane on Christmas morning and there's four feet of snow, that propane truck driver isn't going to want to come out. You want to make sure you have it beforehand. And they're all kind of crazy little heating system. This is probably the craziest heating system I ever saw, but it works very well. This is a uh, turkey fryer on a 55 gallon drum. And what they do, this, this is a nursery in South Louisiana where when they have cold snaps in their cold frames, they set up these, these drums, they fill them full of water and they just boil the water all night long and that steam coming off keeps that greenhouse, moderates the temperature overnight. Um, if it boils dry, that drum will disintegrate on a turkey, you know. If you ever let your tur turkey fryer burn dry, it's gonna uh, melt down. Of course, you're probably not cooking turkeys, you're boiling a wart, right? Anybody burn a, boil a wart? Anybody know what I just said? A wart is the, the brew that you make that you boil up before you ferment your beer. So, um, 